for the spicy takes, but whether you're ready or not, if you're watching, you are gonna get them. Welcome to TYT, I'm your host, Anna Kasparian, and we have a bonanza ahead for you today. In the first hour, we'll talk about a lot of different stories that will probably be rage inducing, including some of the positive commentary that I'm seeing from Democrats toward Liz Cheney for once in her life doing one thing correctly. But should we really be giving her cookies? I would argue no, and I'll make that argument at the top of the show. Later, we'll also talk about a story involving a rookie police officer who was gunned down in a botched robbery here in California. You might be wondering, why do we care about this local story? Well, it has broader ramifications that I wanna discuss. And then in the second hour, Wozni Lombre joins me. We are not having an ice cream party Wednesday. John Idarola is out, he is off, uh, hopefully enjoying some much deserved time off. Uh, but Wozni Lombre is fantastic and we're gonna have uh, great discussions, uh, including some discussions where we will be continuing this dunking sesh that we've been having uh, against Mehmet Oz. Uh, he just continues embarrassing himself and I absolutely love it. Uh, we'll also talk about Texas banning books like uh, Anne Frank's Diary. Which to be quite honest with you was a pivotal book for me to read when I was in elementary school. Because it helped me understand the severity of what happened during the Holocaust. As, as an elementary school kid, learning about something that difficult uh, through Anne Frank's work. We'll talk about that uh, a little later. But before we get to any of that stuff, it's really, really important for you guys to like and share the stream if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're not watching us on YouTube, no worries. There are other ways that you can support the show and get the message out there, including becoming a member. You'll get all sorts of exclusive members only content. Other perks come along with it. Go to tyt.com slash join or click on that join button if you're watching us on YouTube. And just move about the motions. You'll know exactly what to do and how to how to join. and. As always, I really, really appreciate the support. Now, without further ado, let's get to our first story. Two years ago, I won this primary with 73% of the vote. I could easily have done the same again. The path was clear, but it would have required that I go along with President Trump's lie about the 2020 election. It would have required that I enable his ongoing efforts to unravel our democratic system and attack the foundations of our republic. That was a path I could not and would not take. You just heard the concession speech from Wyoming Representative Liz Cheney, who is one of very few Republican lawmakers who's been willing to hold Trump accountable for what he did in inciting violence on January 6th, for what he did in continuing this narrative about the election being stolen from him, when in reality there hasn't been a single shred of evidence indicating widespread voter fraud. And Liz Cheney knew that she was taking a risk by holding Trump accountable. And that risk came to fruition with her essentially losing this primary in her state of Wyoming. Now, as a result, her term will expire on January 3rd of next year. And I wanna give you some more details about what this all means electorally before ripping Cheney to shreds because she does deserve it. Doing one good thing doesn't erase a record of terrible, terrible policies, warmongering, support for war crimes. We'll get to all of that in just a moment. But what were the results of this election? Well, with the Republican Party clearly serving Trump, even when he's not in power, her decision again to hold him accountable hurt her considerably. Harriet Hageman, a lawyer with Trump's endorsement, ousted Cheney on Tuesday, clinching the GOP nomination for deep red Wyoming's only House seat. Cheney fell in defeat despite her appeals to Democrats and independents to re-register as Republicans and vote for her. In fact, her opponent had about 66% to Cheney's nearly 29%. And that's insane because the last time she ran for reelection, she won easily with upward of 70% of the vote in her favor. And it's because she's deeply conservative. Liz Cheney has always been deeply conservative. And despite what she thinks about Donald Trump today, fact of the matter is she voted along with his agenda 90% of the time. So let's not forget about that. 
Now her opponent used to support Cheney, okay, this is Hageman, used to support Cheney. And in 2016, she even opposed Donald Trump calling him, get a load of this, racist and xenophobic. But she has since come to embrace Trump when she realized that it could actually serve her own personal interests, of course. That's my addition. And baselessly claimed that the 2020 election was rigged against him as many successful Republican candidates around the country have claimed. Now, do they claim that because they genuinely think that Biden rigged the election? Or do they say it because they don't have the balls to tell the truth about what really happened? They don't have the balls to stand up to Donald Trump. And more importantly, aside from being massive cowards, these are individuals who are just interested in protecting their own political careers. And they're willing to sell out the American people to do just that. Now, what's even more scary if you take a broader look at what's happening with these congressional elections, some gubernatorial elections as well. In battleground states, candidates who deny the legitimacy of the 2020 vote have won GOP nominations this year for nearly two thirds of state and federal offices with power over elections. So there is a scary component to this because with the help of this right wing media ecosystem, you have Republican voters who have been convinced, absolutely convinced that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. They live in an alternate reality and it's of course partly because they live in a certain filter, media filter bubble where they're hearing lies over and over and over again. Now Trump's impact was felt in some of these other primary races last night. For instance, moderate as she's being described, Lisa Murkowski faced a Trump backed GOP challenger, Kelly Shabaka. And both advanced from an all party primary to the general election. Former Governor Sarah Palin, I can't believe she's still around, an anti establishment Republican backed by Trump, advanced in the all party primary to November's election in Alaska's lone congressional district. Now, there are reports that Liz Cheney is considering what the future holds for her political career. And she was asked point blank during an interview on the Today Show whether she might consider higher office. Let's watch. You said this fight is just beginning. You've even launched a political organization already. So let's just be straight about it. Are you considering running for president yourself? Well, what I'm going to do, Savannah, is Spend the next several months completing my work in Congress, obviously completing my work representing the people of Wyoming. We have a tremendous amount of work left to do on the January 6th committee. She didn't deny that she's considering it. Clearly, it's something that she's thinking about. And while I'm uncertain as to how serious she is in considering a presidential run in 2024, Anyone in the Democratic Party, any Democratic voter who thinks, no, I mean, everything Liz Cheney has done in the past is great, she should totally run. It really depends. How would she run? Would she run as a Republican or would she run as a Democrat? And I think that's a legitimate question to ask because ever since the Trump era came to fruition, what we've noticed is that the so called never Trump Republicans, many of whom were supportive of the Bush administration, have now traveled over to the Democratic Party. And I don't want them, I don't want them at all. I don't want the Democratic Party to be a, essentially become realigned to represent the garbage that we experienced during the Bush years. And Liz Cheney, along with her father, of course, Dick Cheney, It's very representative of the neoconservatives that destroyed this country during Bush's eight years in office. And I think it's really, really important to remember that. Now, that's the reason why I have problems with Cheney. But uh, the Republican voters in Wyoming, they were asked, Wyoming, they were asked, what? What what, what do you think about her potentially running for president in 2024? Let's take a listen to what they had to say.
I don't think I would support her in a presidential run. No, please, no, 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 no. I wouldn't support her as a dog catcher. I still think that Trump did a lot for Wyoming and that we've actually been hurt by our new president. So. Okay. I'm not a Cheney fan. No, I think she should just go back to Virginia and forget, get another job. She's redoing <laughs> her resume today. Now, those interviews serve as anecdotal evidence for the disdain that Republican voters in her own state have toward her. But I would argue that the fact that she very easily lost the primary race is pretty indicative of how Republicans feel about her brand of Republicanism, which is Republicanism that includes all of the policy proposals, all of the ideas that we absolutely hate. But she's willing to tweak the party a little bit by being critical of Donald Trump. Not good enough. Not someone that I want to see as a leader. I will say she's done a good job with the January 6th hearings. She's thorough, she's persuasive, but I'm uncertain as to whether or not she's swayed anyone who was more aligned with Donald Trump's BS about the election being stolen. I think to some extent she's preaching to the choir on that issue. But I do want to talk a little bit about what it would mean if she ran, right? So if she runs as a Republican, I think it might actually be a good thing. Who knows if she would split the vote enough for it to make a difference? But running as a Republican, have at it. It has no impact on me. It has no impact on, you know, where the Democratic Party moves to. So that's fine. But it would be kind of dumb to run as a Republican, wouldn't it? Considering that Trump is the leader of the Republican Party, and the voters seem to really love him. Following the FBI raid, his polling actually increased, and he widened his lead against Ron DeSantis to the tune of 10 points. Ron DeSantis was closing in on him, and then after the raid, his supporters became much more galvanized. So the idea of Liz Cheney running as a Republican for president in 2024 seems like honestly a dumb idea for her. But if she did it, I wouldn't care one way or the other because it really doesn't have an impact on us, right? Now, would she run as a Democrat? I don't think so, but whether she does or doesn't, I think this brings us to a much more important issue that I think needs to be addressed. I've seen other progressive shows and writers address this as well, but I just really want to double down on it. Liz Cheney is not our hero. Liz Cheney is bad, very bad, okay? She didn't really seem to have a problem with Trump for the majority of his term. It wasn't until Trump tried to essentially overturn the results of the presidential election where she realized, nah, maybe I shouldn't continue enabling this clown. And she suffered the political consequences for that to be sure. But nonetheless, let's remember, let's remember who Liz Cheney is, okay? Cheney has built a staunchly conservative voting record over nearly six years in Congress. When Trump was in office, she voted with him more than 90% of the time. Her family is Republican royalty in Wyoming, although I'm a little unsure if that's really still the case. To remind you of a few other things, she promoted regime change in Iran. She also in 2009 founded along with Bill Kristol, another war hawk, something known as Keep America Safe. It's an organization concerned with national security issues, or at least It's an organization that pretends to be concerned about national security issues in order to fear monger to Americans and manufacture consent for more war in countries that we really shouldn't be meddling in. And why does she do it? Could have something to do with the fact that she's looking out for her defense contractor friends, campaign contributors. I mean, you guys know the drill, you know how this all works. Again, the Bush era was a disaster, let's not forget about it. I'm still old enough to remember warrantless wiretapping. I'm still able to remember the torture, which they used euphemisms for like enhanced interrogation, waterboarding people. I still remember what happened at Abu Ghraib, where US members of the military were humiliating, torturing and and photographing uh, some of the prisoners that they had at that facility. Uh, Cheney's also, as I've mentioned, a neoconservative. Her focus has always been on hawkish foreign policy. 
support for the military, which is fine. But when they say support for the military, they're not talking about the men and women who put their lives on the line to defend the country. They pretend like they care about those individuals. But let me remind you, their starting pay is so abysmal that it would make minimum wage workers in this country you know, feel like they might be the lucky ones. They're making less than $20,000 a year starting pay to be a member of the military. Now, when she talks about supporting the military, she talks about supporting the industries that have to do with military operations. Again, these private defense contractors that make a killing off of people pushing for more defense spending and more war, people like Cheney. Um, she's also very pro business uh, and uh, is a so called social conservative. What, what does social conservative mean? Social conservative just means we don't want any social safety net. We don't want any social spending. We want tax cuts for the rich. Again, a representative of everything progressives are supposed to despise. But the establishment Democratic Party is willing to open their arms to her. Because to be quite honest, they're more interested in being inviting toward Bush era Republicans as opposed to leftists or progressives. It's amazing how complimentary they've been toward Cheney, especially over the last year. And finally, let me allow John Nichols to have the last word on Liz Cheney. He had an interview with Democracy Now Today. Here's what he had to say about it. Liz Cheney is every bit as right wing as Donald Trump, perhaps even a little more right wing than him on some issues. And so people should be very cautious about imagining that she would seek office in the future as some sort of moderate Republican or something like that. That's not who she is. She has been good on standing up to Trump on these democracy issues. But the bottom line is she is an extreme right wing conservative. Damn right, she is. There is no way in hell anyone should be referring to her as a moderate Republican. Policy wise, she's not a moderate Republican. And just like Mike Pence, she did the bare minimum, which is stand up to protect our democratic process. That's not some heroic thing to do. That is, again, the bare minimum. And I feel like voters in this country are constantly being conditioned to have insanely low expectations of our politicians, including politicians in the party we just support, and even politicians in the party we don't support. Certainly the case with Liz Cheney. We need to have higher standards. And just because we might share an enemy with Liz Cheney, doesn't mean that she would be a good representative for the American people, doesn't mean that she would be a good leader. In fact, everything that we are feeling pain from today policy wise, she has supported and she would double down on if she had the chance to do it. That's who Liz Cheney is. So sure, kudos for standing up to Donald Trump, knowing that it's gonna cost you a congressional seat, but she knows she's gonna be just fine. That revolving door keeps revolving. It's not like she's gonna be jobless, she'll be okay. In the meantime, let's not be stupid and pretend like she's America's hero for doing the bare minimum. All right, we gotta take a break. When we come back, we've got more news you can use, including Trump getting rejected by lawyers. They don't wanna represent him, can you blame them? So we'll do a little dunking sesh and then we'll continue, we'll be right back. What's up, party people? Welcome back to TYT. We've got a lot more news to get to, and maybe we need a little bit of a break from some of the devastation in the country. So let's make fun of Trump because there's definitely something worth making fun of here. Poor, poor Donald Trump. He's trying and failing to find legal representation to defend him in this ongoing investigation regarding the top secret and classified documents that he potentially illegally took home with him to Mar-a-Lago. Now, when you take a look at Donald Trump's history with refusing to pay his lawyers 
or his history of throwing people under the bus after they go through great lengths and bend over backwards to help him. You'll understand why lawyers might not be as willing to represent him in any case. But when it comes to something as big as treason charges or potential treason charges, you can understand why maybe representing Trump is not in anyone's best interest. But here's what we know based on a report from the Washington Post. Everyone is saying no, said a prominent Republican lawyer who, like some others, spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss confidential conversations. Longtime confidants and advisors of Trump have grown extremely worried about Trump's current stable of lawyers, noting that most of them have little to no experience in cases of this type. So his legal team consists of pretty inexperienced lawyers, and I think that's reflected in the way that some of these investigations are going. You've got lawyers who have never dealt with any government related lawsuits or criminal investigations. You have lawyers who have tiny little firms and have focused primarily on like real estate law. It's just not looking good for Trump. And look, to be sure, everyone deserves lawyers who will defend them, but no lawyer is forced to defend him. And that's where he runs into a problem here. Now, John Sale, who's a prominent Florida defense attorney who worked on the Watergate prosecution team, said that he turned down representing Trump last week. In fact, he's one of the few lawyers who was, you know, who received a call from Trump. And it was, I guess, courageous enough to talk about it on the record. He said this, You have to evaluate whether you want to take it. It's not like a DUI. It's representing the former president of the United States and maybe the next one in what's one of the highest visibility cases ever. So I think what Sale said there was, you know, he was being careful. Let's be, let's be careful. But I could also read between the lines. And when a lawyer is willing to sign on to an investigation or a case involving Donald Trump, they run the risk of, again, Trump throwing them under the bus. They run the risk of eventually becoming part of the investigation. As is the case, by the way, with the lawyer who lied to the DOJ about Trump having those classified documents in the first place. That lawyer might be in a lot of trouble. But nonetheless, here's what else we know. In another potential complication, any lawyer who made assurances to the FBI on Trump's behalf, again, could end up in a lot of trouble because don't lie on behalf of Trump. Trump search is also being hampered by his divisiveness, as well as his reputation for refusing to pay vendors and contractors who have worked for him. So let's talk about that a little bit. One lawyer told a story from early in Trump's presidency of his legal team urging him against tweeting about the Mueller probe, only to find he tweeted about it before they got to the end of the West Wing driveway. Several people said Trump was nearly impossible to represent and that it would be unclear if they would ever get paid. I've been in situations where family members ask me to take care of their kid for a day, right? And you know, I don't have kids of my own, I don't want kids of my own, but I've got that, you know, that itch sometimes. I like kids, I like to be around them, I like to take care of them and, and help my family members out when I can. Um, children, literal three year olds and four year olds, are better at following instructions than the former president of the United States. And so yeah, any lawyer who would consider representing him knowing full well that he will not take your legal advice is crazy, absolutely crazy. And I knew that this day would come when lawyers would realize "Mm, not worth it. It it almost never works out for Trump's lawyers. Um, His former personal attorney, Michael Cohen also weighed in on this saying in the olden days, He would tell firms representing him uh, was a benefit because they could advertise off of it. Okay, let's just stop for one second. This statement from Michael Cohen triggered me a little bit, not because I'm mad at Michael Cohen, but because it reminds me of all the times people request free work from you because you don't need the money, you need the exposure. 
Now it really depends on where you work. If you work in media, it happens all the time. No, do it, do it. Please spend your entire day working for free because you get exposure. It's just it's just theft, really. It's it's stealing people's time and energy. Michael Cohen continues to say, today is not the same. He's also a very difficult client in that he's always pushing the envelope. He rarely listens to sound legal advice and he wants you to do things that are not appropriate ethically or legally. And Michael Cohen should know he served time in prison because he was Trump's former personal attorney who did unethical and illegal things on Trump's behalf. Not smart, very dumb. So I love this story because far too often we come across people in positions of power who are treated as if they are above the law. Or they just never suffer the same consequences that ordinary people would suffer. Normal people don't get a two month warning to hand over the documents or else you'll get raided. Please turn over the document. We know you have the documents, turn them over Mr. Trump or else we're gonna have to do a raid. And Trump's like, mm. tells his lawyer to tell the DOJ, we ain't got no documents. They gave Trump two months to comply, a subpoena to turn over the classified documents. He wouldn't do it. And the day the raid happened, wasn't it wasn't a no knock raid, it wasn't a surprise. His lawyers were full, fully aware that the raid was gonna happen. So I mean, I think everyone deserves a fair investigation, even people I despise. I believe in fairness. I believe that everyone should have the ability to defend themselves. So on one hand, it's kind of scary to not find a single lawyer, a decent lawyer who's willing to represent you. At the same time, I believe this is called when the chickens come home to roost. If you don't pay people, they're not gonna wanna work for you. If you continuously throw people under the bus, they're not gonna wanna be allies to you. And that's where Trump is today. And sorry if I find a little bit of enjoyment reading about that. All right, well, let's move on to some other news. A story from California that I think it's upsetting because this isn't an isolated case. There have been several high profile stories like this where some of the details are different, but the overall theme is similar. And I just wanted to bring it to your attention. Suspects have been arrested for their alleged role in a botched robbery where a Monterey Park, California police officer was shot and killed. That was the result of this botched robbery. So, 26 year old Gardiel Solario was the officer who was shot and killed. He had only been on the police force for one month. He was a rookie cop. And when he was outside of an LA fitness gym waiting in his vehicle, he was approached by one of the suspects who then proceeded to attempt to rob him. The situation fell apart and in the end, again, this 26 year old police officer, rookie cop, was shot and killed. Now the Los Angeles District Attorney, George Gascon, did a press conference where he addressed the severity of the incident. So let's take a quick look at that. The defendant got out of a car nearby, approached Officer Solorio with a gun drawn in what appeared to be in attempted robbery, Officer Solorio was in his vehicle. Officer Solorio attempted to flee by backing out of his vehicle when the suspect fired multiple times. The defendant then returned back to the vehicle where a juvenile was behind the wheel and they fled the scene. Today, we'll file one count of murder with special circumstances allegations that the murder occurred 
during the commission of a robbery against Carlos Del Cid. Carlos Del Cid is the name of the individual who ended up shooting the weapon or firing the weapon and shooting and killing the cop. Um, it's interesting that in that press conference, Gascon mentioned the enhancements uh, that will be added to the charges here because he is not a fan of enhancements, including gun enhancements. So for instance, if someone has committed a crime and while committing that crime, they were in possession of an illegal gun, an illegal gun. Gascon does not like to add additional charges related to the illegal gun. Which I think is very strange in a state that purports to care so much about gun control. So when you have an opportunity to penalize or prosecute someone who is in possession of an illegal gun, you should maybe take that opportunity, just, just saying for a second. Now let's get into the details about who Carlos Del Cid is. Carlos Del Cid is again, just one of the suspects here. There were two others who were arrested, one of whom was a 17 year old who drove the getaway vehicle. Since he's underage, we don't know too many details about him. Those records are sealed. So here's a photo of him, his mugshot. And there are many mugshots of Carlos Del Cid because he has a lengthy criminal record and was not supposed to be roaming the streets considering his violent criminal record. What do I mean by that? Let's get into the details. Court records show Del Cid was arrested in February of this year. After pleading no contest to two felony charges, he was sentenced to 180 days in jail and four years formal probation on March 10th. The 20 year old was actually released the next day for what jail records describe as a short sentence. All right. George Gascon was asked about this, like, what's up with this short sentence? Why didn't your prosecutors, you know, ensure that this guy who committed violent crimes didn't get released the next day after his sentencing? And here's what he had to say. Any questions concerning the actual length of time spent in custody should be directed to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. All right, well, look, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is very problematic. There is evidence of literal uh, gang activity within that department. So uh, when Gascon says maybe you should look at the Sheriff's Department, I'm actually sympathetic to that. So the Sheriff's Department actually did respond to uh, the press when they asked questions. The Los Angeles County District's attorney dropped three of the, felon, of the five felony charges. On March 10th of 2022, suspect Del Cid was sentenced to four years of formal probation and 180 days in county jail with a credit for 58 days served. It was the district attorney's decision to drop the serious violent felony charges that would have rendered the suspect ineligible for early release. And guess what, I looked into that and believe it or not, the sheriff's department is right. The district attorney's office did allow for a plea deal situation in which the most Serious charges pertaining to his violent crimes were dropped. So let's go to the Los Angeles Times. And let me be clear, Los Angeles Times loves to carry water for the failed policies that we've been seeing from George Gascon in Los Angeles. They love it. They defend him all the time. But this is what they wrote. Del Cid had previously been arrested December 8th by Los Angeles County deputies from the Lomita Station booking records show. He was cited and released the next day. Records do not show the alleged offense, but it appeared to be a felony level crime. Okay, so we don't know the details of what that felony was, but he was released the next day after committing this felony crime. Okay, great. The Los Angeles Police Department's Harbor Division arrested Del Cid on February 10th, and he was charged five days later with burglary, domestic violence, assault with a deadly weapon false imprisonment and intimidating a witness. The crimes reportedly occurred on February 9th, records show. All right, these crimes are serious, these aren't, he didn't just get caught with a baggie of pot, okay? He committed violent crimes. And by the way, the 180 day sentence is super short considering there's like kidnapping involved, 
domestic violence, intimidating a witness. These are serious crimes. Okay, so the initial sentence, 180 days, I would venture to say pretty short. I know, I know, I know there are people on the left that are like, no, not too short, 180 days, too long. Good that he beat up his wife. Okay, I'm, I'm embellishing a little bit, but that's how the left comes across when it comes to these types of stories. 180 days, he didn't even serve the 180 days. He was released the next day. On March 10th, he pleaded no contest to burglary and domestic violence while the other charges were dismissed. A judge in Long Beach sentenced him to 180 days in jail and four years of probation, court records show. He was released the morning after that sentence was handed down, having spent a month behind bars according to Sheriff's Department booking records. So he actually was able to get away with the assault. Assault with a deadly weapon, that charge was dropped as part of the plea deal that was negotiated by the district attorney's office, by the prosecutors. Do you understand that? Why would you drop the most serious charges here? Uh, no false imprisonment charges, that was dropped too. No charges for intimidating a witness because that was dropped as well as part of this plea deal. I wanna be clear, when I was signing up for criminal justice reform, I thought we were gonna do things like reform our prisons. So they're actually you know, rehabilitating people. I thought we were gonna do something about policing. I thought we were gonna end qualified immunity. So cops can't get away with shooting down unarmed individuals as they're running away from them. We didn't do that. I thought that we were going to provide funding for actual robust programs that would help nonviolent offenders transition back into society so they live full happy lives. Didn't do that either. Instead, we're playing this game where we just and by the way, I also never thought that anyone was advocating for the early release of violent criminals, including individuals who have literally been in prison for murdering others. But it turns out California's all about it, and I ain't. I think it's a terrible, terrible way to go about this. This ain't reform. It's all about playing patty cakes with people who are not in any way rehabilitated, who have committed incredibly violent crimes and in some cases robbed others of their lives. And get a load of this Los Angeles Times headline. Amid COVID-19, California releases some inmates doing time for murder. Advocates push to free more. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy, I don't believe in the death penalty. But I would say that if you murder someone, and you have spent time in a facility, in a prison that does not rehabilitate because that's what our prisons are. It's very unlikely that you're rehabilitated and just releasing you into the world with no rehabilitation, it's a bad idea, bad idea. More than 63,000 inmates convicted of violent crimes will be eligible for good behavior credits that shorten their sentences by one third instead of one fifth that had been in place since 2017. That includes nearly 20,000 inmates who are serving life sentences with the possibility of parole. Keep in mind, by the way, we don't even know how these good credits are determined. There's really no specificity there. More than 10,000 inmates convicted of a second serious but nonviolent offense under the state's three strikes law will be eligible for release after serving half their sentences. That's an increase from the current time served credit of one third of their sentence. And if you think that, no, come on, Anna, they're just, they're not releasing violent criminals, even though the reports indicate they are, they're just, this is all about nonviolent individuals. No, actually, a much smaller portion of the individuals who have been released from California state prisons are nonviolent offenders. Los Angeles Times has the numbers. The same increased release time will apply to nearly 2,900 nonviolent third strikers, the corrections department projected. And the reason why is because the nonviolent offenders are in county jails. They're, the majority of them are not in state prisons. So this is the state releasing inmates. And there was a little bit of backlash, luckily. And the California Supreme Court weighed in in the summer. And I think that they made the right decision here. 
Because fact of the matter is, California voters overwhelmingly voted in favor of something known as Prop 57. And so Prop 57, I voted for it, was marketed to voters in California as, hey, our prison population is ridiculous. We have all sorts of nonviolent people serving time when they shouldn't be. So I was in favor of early release because I thought, as it was advertised to me, that it was only nonviolent individuals. But it didn't work out that way. And so uh, there was a fight, there was backlash, and finally the California uh, Supreme Court weighed in. The justices found that the ballot materials revealed that the voters intended to exclude any inmate currently serving a term for a violent felony from early parole consideration, regardless of whether such an inmate has also been convicted of a nonviolent felony. And the high court ruled that corrections officials acted properly in drafting regulations that exclude from early parole consideration any prisoner who is currently serving a term of incarceration for a violent felony. There's a lot we can do to reform our justice system. And I have a long history of talking about those things. So if anyone thinks that I'm just trying to be tough on crime, you are mistaken. But for anyone who thinks we need to be soft on violent criminals, including those who have committed murder, not in favor of that. I think it's dumb policy, I think it's dangerous policy. And for progressives who are looking to rally support, I don't know if you're gonna win if you have all these people being victimized by violent criminals who are just released from prison with no rehabilitative plan in place. That's the reality. I know some of you wanted some specificity when I talk about the disastrous decisions being made in California. Here's one of them. We got to take a break. When we come back, we've got more news, including one of the most terrible stories involving the ramifications of these abortion bans in various states. Stay tuned, we've got that and more coming right up. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to TYT. I just want to give a shout out to Anthony McLendon, who writes in and just had such a great comment that made me feel pretty good. So thank you, Anthony. Uh, Hi, Anna. I love your Wednesday solo hour. When you compared it to making a case in court, you were spot on. Each story makes a point, then you tie each point together, make the case and show how it fits into the larger picture. Thank you. I mean, in the era of like super quick, short videos and short attention spans, it feels good to know that um, the longer form content is still appreciated. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys are getting something out of it. Well, let's move on to our next story because uh, this is just the continuation of the pain and suffering that people are feeling across this country as a result of the reversal of Roe v. Wade. and. Uh, It's one of the hardest stories that I've produced in a long time. So let's get to it. She's gonna pass this fetus in the toilet. She's gonna have to deal with that on her own. There's a 50% chance, greater than 50% chance that she's gonna lose her uterus. There's a 10% chance that she will develop sepsis and herself die. That weighs on me, I voted for that bill. You just heard from a Republican state lawmaker from the state of South Carolina, which is working to pass a near like abortion ban with very few exceptions. In fact, there's only one exception in the legislation that's being debated right now. And it would be to save a woman's life if the pregnancy is putting her health or life in jeopardy. Now, Neil Collins is the representative you heard from in that video. And he seems to feel a little bit of remorse for voting in favor of legislation that restricts abortions in his state because he was confronted by a specific story involving a woman who had a non-viable fetus and her health was in jeopardy as a result of that, but she was denied an abortion anyway. He gives more detail in the next clip. A 19 year old girl appeared at the ER. She was 15 weeks pregnant. Her Water broke. 
and the, the fetus was unviable. The standard of care was to advise her uh, that they could extract or she could go home. The attorneys told the doctors that because of the fetal heartbeat bill, because that 15 week old had a heartbeat, the doctors could not extract. I followed up with the doctor a week later. She had heard nothing, did not know about the 19 year old. Thank God I followed up two weeks later. She did return to the ER. They did extract the now non-beating fetus. What we do matters. And you can see he's visibly emotional there. And look, I, I gotta I gotta say, while I might disagree with this state representative Neil Collins on pretty much every issue, it's so rare to see any Republican politician, whether it's on a federal or state level, who has any humanity left, really. And the fact that he's willing to speak out against something that he himself voted in favor of, knowing full well that the majority of every Republican in that state, every Republican lawmaker in that state in favor of this kind of legislation. It, I just wanna give him some props even though there might be a lot of disagreement. Because again, it's rare to see that level of humanity among Republican politicians these days. Now, State Representative Neil, Neil Collins told South Carolina's House Judiciary Committee that he would not be voting on a ban that only has exceptions for saving the life of the mother. The bill provides no provisions for victims of rape or incest. And clearly, as you can tell from the story that he shared with everybody, State also doesn't make any exceptions for a woman whose actual health is in jeopardy unless she, you know, gets that unviable fetus extracted. Just because it had a heartbeat, in, in their minds, a heartbeat. Doesn't matter that that pregnancy isn't gonna make it. Doesn't matter that this 19 year old, 19. Worst case scenario, which doctors put at 50%, by the way, she was gonna lose her uterus, which means she would never be able to have children again. Ah, who cares? Who cares? We're not draconian enough. We're here to talk about making this even more draconian. That's what that's what this whole meeting was about. And so unfortunately, the near total abortion ban has advanced in the South Carolina legislature. A South Carolina House committee advanced a near total abortion ban, largely along party lines in a 13 to seven vote on Tuesday. The bill which was advanced out of the Republican controlled state House Judiciary Committee would prohibit abortions in the state with exceptions in case where the life or health of the mother is at risk. Five committee members did not cast a vote. But even so, guys, I mean, clearly, this woman's health was at risk. I mean, she could have died from sepsis. But the council representing the hospital was like, don't, mm -mm, don't take that risk. You might be prosecuted. These Republican lawmakers are nuts. They'll rain terror on you. You don't, you don't want to lose your license. You don't want to go to court. You don't want the hospital to go bankrupt due to legal fees, don't do it, just don't do it. And they didn't, they didn't do it until that non-viable fetus, unviable fetus no longer had a heartbeat. And these consequences for the Republican culture war, the culture war that is waged on women in this country, are dire, okay? Because while luckily it seems like this 19 year old ended up being okay, that was a massive risk. And then there are other incidents. Like let's take a let's take a quick trip to Louisiana, for instance, where one woman found out that her fetus was not developing properly. The fetus doesn't have a head. Let me let me just repeat that one more time. The fetus does not have a head. So eventually, since the fetus is not developing appropriately, she was gonna miscarry. And so she could either 
wait for that day, which will be painful and potentially dangerous. Or she can go to the doctor's office and they can extract the unviable headless fetus. But Louisiana wouldn't allow her to do that because of their abortion restrictions. I mean, it's just, there it is. Woman may be forced to give birth to a headless baby because of an abortion ban. Abortions in Louisiana are now only permitted to prevent the death or substantial risk of death due to a physical condition or to prevent the serious permanent impairment of a life sustaining organ of a pregnant woman. And Nancy Davis, who's the woman who's now going to have to suffer the consequences of the Republican war on women says, it's hard knowing that I'm carrying it to bury it. Super pro-life, right? She's gonna have to deliver, likely in her bathroom, sitting on a toilet by herself, maybe with her partner if her partner's there. She's gonna have to deliver a headless fetus. Either that or she's gotta gather the resources necessary to travel out of state to a place called civilization where she gets to make decisions about her own body. Just today on Twitter, a conservative who's upset at anyone who would try to persuade Americans to get the COVID vaccine was mad at me. Because I was like, look, you guys wanna get the vaccine, don't get the vaccine, I don't care anymore. Do whatever you want. And his argument to me was, "Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to have my bodily autonomy. Right wingers, crack me up. You have no place in any conversation pertaining to bodily autonomy. Especially when you support policies that force women to give birth to a headless baby in their home because doctors can't do it. You wanna talk about bodily autonomy. You know, let's talk about the bodily autonomy of a 10 year old rape victim in Ohio who had to travel out of state to abort the rapist baby. I mean, it's just disgusting. These people are gross. They don't believe in freedom. They don't believe in what this country was supposed to stand for, the idea of America. They just wanna crush you with whatever their alleged belief system is. And at the end of the day, they don't even believe their own belief system. Cuz there's an endless number of Republicans in this country who have rushed their women over to the abortion clinic as soon as they found out there was an unwanted pregnancy. Should talk to Congressman Desjardins. Whose wife and mistress got abortions from his them urging to do it. It's all about punishment, it's all about control. And for politicians, it's about political power, that's it. All right, we're out of time. We've got more news with Wozni Lombre in the second hour. Don't miss it, we'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.